Okay, it is 6.58. Uh, my name is Mike Staten. I'm a soybean educator with Michigan State University Extension, and I'd like to welcome you to the virtual breakfast. With us today, we're lucky to have uh, Dennis Pennington. Dennis is the MSU wheat specialist with Michigan State University, and he's going to give us some keen wheat insights for 2024. Dennis, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, like Mike said, uh, type questions in the chat. Um, if you got questions, we'll try to answer them probably at the end, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely I want to make sure I'm uh, cover any questions you might have. So I'm going to talk to you about a, a few different topics, uh, questions, of, mostly about questions that I've been getting from producers um, about wheat. So the first question I've gotten quite a bit is what has the mild winter, um, what impact will that have on our crop? And people want to know, have we broke dormancy? Have we greened up? And uh, they're kind of using those terms interchangeably. So I put an article together um, to talk about these things, but uh, I'll just briefly explain what the difference between the, they, them are here. So to break dormancy, there's kind of two rules of thumb. Uh, the first rule of thumb is when the soil temperatures get up to 48 degrees Fahrenheit for at least uh, 50 hours. Um, the second one is having seven consecutive days in a row with the uh, growing degree accumulations for wheat are greater than zero. So having seven days in a row with positive GDD accumulation um, is, is the other. And these two rules of thumb generally are within a few days of each other. Um, if you if you pull the, the data and look at that information, um, they're usually pretty close. Green up needs a little bit more heat units. Um, so just breaking dormancy means that the wheat plant um, is no longer dormant and then it's ready to start growing. Green up, um, needs a little a few more heat units so this we say can seven consecutive days where the gdd on each day is at least five um, so th it takes a little bit more heat for that to occur um, i recorded a video uh, on how to calculate wheat gdds um, it it shows you how to access in viral weather um, you can pull up your nearest weather station uh, and, and and download data or just look at it on the screen whichever you want to do so um, I think Mike's going to put that URL in the chat. So uh, I think it's like a five minute video on and it just it shows how to download uh, and, and pull GDD data for wheat uh, from EnviroWeather. So um, I, I put more information in detail um, in the last Wheat Wisdom newsletter um, and there's a URL for that. Um, and if you're not signed up for the Wheat Wisdom newsletter, I would encourage you to do that. Um, we send out a monthly newsletter to wheat growers uh, with production information, um, calendar of events, um, other things going on in the industry and, and whatnot. So, but in that article, um, and I did this back on March 8th, and so I pulled weather data from the Enviro Weather uh, Program for Deerfield, Mount Pleasant, and Verona stations. And I, so, and I calculated the growing degree days with the base zero, which is what we do for wheat, um, from January 1 through March 7th. Okay, so that's this this is this time frame is, is when I pulled this this information. And here's the amount of GDDs that we accumulated in, in each of those locations. I pulled all five uh, previous years to get a five year average. This is the average of five years. And notice here we've got quite a big departure from normal. Um, it was warmed up really early. We were accumulating GDDs very quickly. Uh, and so we were way ahead of normal. Um, in fact, we broke dormancy. If you follow these rules above, we broke dormancy um, at all three locations. Um, and we actually achieved green up at the Deerfield location. Uh, we were getting close at Mount Pleasant and close at Verona, but we hadn't quite hit it yet. So just to see where we are today, I pulled this, uh, I think it was on Tuesday of this week. Um, so now this is the same data. It goes January 1 through March 31st, okay, which was, uh, what, Monday. So you can see what the GDD accumulation was. You can see what the five-year average was. But notice now we're not quite so far ahead. These last two weeks of March um, have been cooler, uh, more on par. We have not accumulated a whole lot of uh, heat units in, in those days. And uh, I, I would say we're starting to get – we're we're still ahead of normal um, – just, just based on these numbers, but we're still not quite um, 
we, we've slowed right up. The wheat has kind of put the brakes on as far as uh, growth and development. And notice down here in the bottom uh, right here, we still have not officially had green up at, at Mount Pleasant or Verona. We've come close. We've had five days of five GDDs or higher, um, but we haven't quite um, broken dormancy yet. So another topic is is rolling wheat. I've had quite a few questions from growers. When is the right time um, and and whatnot? So Feeks 3 is the best time uh, to roll wheat. And the reason is because it's still in the tillering stage. Um, and the reason you would roll wheat or the reason, um, you know, some people do it anyway, is uh, late planted wheat that hasn't tillered out enough in the, in the previous fall. And they're in the spring now and uh, they would like to promote tillering. Um, so what happens is when that roller goes across, it breaks the stem or it damages it to some degree. Um, and what that does is stimulates tillering. So you want to do this um, while it is still in Feeks 3 and still in the tillering phase. Um, once you get to Feeks 4, tillering is over. And now if you do any damage to the stem, it's just damage to the stem. It's the plant um, isn't able to respond to it. The other reason that people are telling me that uh, they're doing is because it uh, is a poor man's rock picker. Um, it pushes down rocks so that they can run the header closer to the ground. Um, and this is usually for the, the folks that are baling straw on there. So the biggest thing with this is make sure the field conditions are right. Um, there are places in Michigan uh, where we're far enough advanced with the wheat crop now along in the southern part of the state uh, where I would definitely not get out there and roll. Um, but so the roller might not cause a whole lot of damage, but look at in this picture, look at what the tractor tire uh, damage is. You can see it all the way back um, to the other end of the field. So, you know, and this implement looks to me to be maybe 25 or 30 foot wide. So you're going to have these tire tracks every 25 or 30 feet um, going across the field. And you just basically wiped out uh, about a foot or foot and a half of wheat. Um, in two tracks going all the way across the field, that will have a significant impact on, you, on your yield, a reduction on your yield. So other items to look at in the spring, um, now is a good time to assess your current situation, get out and scout fields, determine what growth stage you're at. Um, and if you have wheat planted at different dates, um, check those because they might be at different growth stages. Um, conduct stand accounts, dig some plants, check the roots for growth, um, look for any damage, and then quantify how much damage you have, and use that information to determine are there immediate needs that you need to do in the field. And then start looking to the future um, in terms of are, do you have any diseases starting to come in, um, what kind of management do you want to apply um, to the crop, um, and so on. So when you're assessing stands, uh, make sure you understand what's going on with the crop. Um, in the left hand picture there, there's actually two plants in my hand. Um, and the uh, on the, the plant on the left there, that's just the, the coleop tile is at the base right here and it stops right about where my pointer is at. So the first true leaf is just coming out right here um, on this plant right next to it. That's got the second true leaf coming out. Now over here on the right, um, this plant on the right, the first tiller is just starting, the, the tip of the leaf is just starting to emerge right there. So when that emerges, that will be tiller number one. And then on this plant, um, this plant actually has uh, about four tillers on it uh, already. So this one's in good shape. Ideally, if you could have this coming into the spring, this amount of tillering, uh, you're in pretty good shape. So I make sure you get out there and you look for these things in the field. Another thing, when you dig plants and, and look at them, oops, um, you want to check the root system. Dig and check. You want good crown root development um, starting as early in the spring as you can. Um, this plant here on the left uh, doesn't have a whole lot of crown root growth yet. Um, I would keep an eye on that plant because that one won't tolerate stress nearly as well as these will. And if you're finding plants that look like this, that basically has almost nothing for a root system. I would expect that those that plant will not survive. It's still green right now. I mean, seeing as the in my hand there, but it I don't expect that one um, to survive at all. So if you've got a lot of these um, in the field, you're you're you may have to think about tearing it up. So assess the stands for um, flooding. Uh, you know, this usually occurs with snow melt, but we really haven't had a lot of snow um, lately. Uh, we have had some rains, so just keep an eye on that. 
Um, I've had people tell me that their field is dead. Um, they drive by on the road and they look out across there and it looks brown. Well, if they actually get out there and look, it's probably this purple leaves. Um, that is caused by uh, accumulation of photosynthates um, on a warm or on a sunny day when it's cool in the spring. Um, photosynthates accumulate in these leaves, and, and, and part of those photosynthates have anthocyanins, um, which make the, the leaf turn kind of that purplish or deep red uh, color. Um, as I said, pull plants, check the crown. Uh, the crown uh, right now, because we haven't reached feet six yet, um, is the crown is still below the soil surface. So slice open this stem and see what it looks like. Notice this one uh, looks kind of brown. Uh, necrotic, um, this plant probably will not survive. Um, so be checking for that. You want this to be nice, bright white um, and turgid. Uh, and so when you, when you pinch it with your finger, it's not mushy. So check for all those things. Um, I would encourage you to do some stand counts, measure three feet of row, count the number of plants in each row, and then just do a simple average on the number of plants per foot. And do this in different locations in the field. Um, you don't want to pick just your best spots to do the, the stand counts, and you don't want to pick just your worst spots in the field to do the stand counts. You want a good average of the entire field. Um, this chart comes from University of Kentucky Bulletin, um, and it gives you some targets. Um, it's got the percent of yield potential on the right-hand side, you know, and you want you want to be in this 100. So if you're on seven and a half inch rows, you need between 15 and 18 plants um, per foot of row. Um, and so, you know, the target ought to be 18 plants at a minimum um, per square foot, because if you get down into the, you know, 11, 14 or anything like that, now you can see you're going to have some yield reduction. So use those dis for decisions in, in what you're going to do with, with the crop. Timing of applications, um, we're getting close to, uh, in fact, in some places we're already at FIX4. Um, so uh, PGR applications could start. Um, I would say we got to be careful of the temperatures uh, for that. We don't want cold temperatures overnight. Um, but uh, for those that uh, need to use a plant growth regulator, where you've got planted early at maybe a high seeding density, um, you've got some available nitrogen, uh, maybe from a manure application, uh, maybe a PGR would be a good idea. So um, right now, the only thing we have licensed in Michigan is Palisade. Um, and you can put on a single application anywhere between FIX 4 to 7, uh, up to 14.4 ounces. Some people will put on two uh, applications or a split. Um, so you can do that at FIX 4 to 5 and at FIX 7. Just make sure altogether you're not putting on more than 14.4. Um, there will be a couple new products in 2025. Um, Palisade Max is a new formulation from Syngenta. It'll have some cold uh, tolerance uh additive in it that helps it tolerate colder temperatures better. And then it just is the other one that's a chlormaquat chloride product that's used in um, Canada and Europe. So for herbicide application, you wanna um, try to uh, make sure you, you, the average temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So if it gets up to 60 during the day and down to 40 at night, that average temperature is 50 um, and avoid a frost. Christy covered this in the first um, virtual breakfast, so go there um, for more information. And I think when we warm up, we are going to rapidly get to FIC 6. Um, and I, I believe there's warm weather coming in the forecast, so um, make sure you're, you're on top of what stage of growth your wheat is. And remember, there are some products that you can apply only up to uh, FIC 6. And then after that, you got to switch to different uh, products. So just keep that in mind. And uh, to kind of wrap things up here a bit, um, I've got a bunch of questions. There's some concern. There's some press releases out there about how bad it is in Michigan as far as the number of acres of wheat and, and what the size of the wheat crop is going to look like. Um, so here's some data from uh, National Ag Statistics Service. Um, for the last seven years, I've got the top row is the number of acres harvested in Michigan. The second row is number of acres planted. Notice that the, the planted acres is always higher than um, the harvested acres, um, and that could be that acres were taken out of production or maybe they uh, partially missed the mark on their estimated planting, um, but it's always lower. The next row is the percentage lower, um, and then we got the, the total production in terms of in millions of bushels and then the average yield and then the price on the bottom here. 
And for notice for 2024, um, that's estimated that we have uh, planted 420,000 acres um, in Michigan. So a couple of things, um, I, I put the, the planted or the production um, in the blue bars here. Um, and notice that we tend to hover right around this 35 line. Uh, most years were right around 35. We did have two years of the last seven where we ticked up quite a bit. Um, but if we think of 35 as a good average, um, if you take the planted acres at 420,000, the average reduction in acres as far as what's harvested is about 8%. Um, if you use a, an average yield of 83, you multiply that out, and that's about a 32.2 million bushel production. And if you compare that to, say, 35 is kind of the standard, we're about an 8% reduction in bushels for 24. So um, I just wanted to also mention uh, the wheat program does diagnostics. If you have a wheat field with some damage or issues going on it, um, they can help you diagnose it. Uh, the, the plant diagnostic lab at Michigan State University uh, will do those and the Michigan Wheat Program will pay for the diagnostics. So I'll wrap up with, uh, we have uh, some strategic planning that the Michigan Wheat Program has done. Um, and we're, one of the things that came out of that strategic planning is that we need to reassess um, what our research priorities are. So we need your ideas um, and there is a survey, uh, it's a Qualtrics survey. So if you would uh, take a minute and go fill that out um, I think you can do it in probably five minutes, um, so it shouldn't take too long. So that's it for now, Mike. I will turn it back to you. So now we're at the point in the program where we, we ask Dennis and uh, Jeff and, and probably any of the other specialists that are with us to answer any of your questions. So um, there are a few questions in the chat. I'll pull those up and, and, uh, and read those. So... Um, the first one that we got was from um, Gordon Briggs. Any idea how many bushels, this is for Dennis, I think, how, how, any idea how many bushels of wheat typically come into Michigan from other states? That's a good question, and I can't answer that for sure. I know we do bring in um, some wheat from other states. Um, I know there's one mill in particular that brings in some spring wheat. Um from the Dakotas, uh, and it, it's just simply due to the, what their customer is that they're milling wheat for. They need some of that kind of product in there. But um, we just had our strategic planning uh, session with the Michigan Wheat Program, and I, learning more about the markets and what's going on in Michigan was one of the things that came out as a key priority. So I imagine we will start to do some work in that area to try to more characterize and get a better understanding of what the flow of wheat is in and out of the state. But I, I just don't have an answer for it for that right now. And another wheat question, Dennis, this is from Dave Goretzky. Um, what are your thoughts on the new PGR for 2025, the Canadian slash Europe one? How is it like Palisade? How is it different? And what are the usage recommendations? Yeah, so Palisade, the active ingredient is Trinexapac ethyl, and it just um, is Clormaquat chloride as the active ingredient. And um, we actually use Clormaquat chloride in the greenhouse um, because we're, especially in our disease screening, because we need short plants because um, we're infecting them with disease and we don't, we need to have them stand up enough that we can actually do our assessments and, and, and whatnot and not have them lodge in a greenhouse. So we've used Clormaquat chloride in a greenhouse setting um, for years. Um, the, the thing that I think uh, the Clormaquat chloride has a, a bit of an advantage um, is that it can be applied at much colder temperatures. So like if we are at FEEX 4 right now out there, technically we are at the beginning of when we can make applications you can apply chlormaquat chloride down to um, about 32 degrees Fahrenheit and not damage the crop. Now, that being said, my understanding is that Palisade Max has some additive in it that allows application at colder temperatures, but I don't know if it goes that cold or not. Um, I do have uh, a research trial this year um, that we'll be putting out to evaluate both of those products. Um, so I can report back more, uh, you know, after harvest this year. But um, when I was in Germany, uh, those folks use uh, Clormaquat chloride to even manipulate tillering. So if they get planted early in the fall, 
they might put an application of PGR on in the fall to slow down the tillering. Um, now that's not really a problem in Michigan, but then they'll make applications in the spring. And one thing that we've noticed a bit is it tends to knock back apical dominance. So if you go out um, after wheat is headed out and getting closer to harvest and pull one plant um, and look at the, the heads and where they are located, the main stem head is usually the far farthest up in the canopy. And then the, the tillers are usually a little bit lower in that canopy. Um, what we think that product might be doing is, is knocking back that apical dominance. So those, those tiller heads are at about the same level and they are filling grain equally to the main head. So that would be a significant benefit um, if, if that would hold true uh, here in our climates um, in Michigan. So um, the Palisade Max and the Adjust will, it's in the process of being labeled with EPA, but it won't be labeled in time to be used for this spring application. So it'll be available, both of them will be available um, for spring of 25. And, uh, I think you answered Phil Cates' question, but he wanted to know why plant growth regulators are so important to use in wheat. But I think you covered that. But if there's anything else you want to add, Dennis? Yeah, so um, plant growth regulators are, there are certain situations where, where, where you might need a PGR. Um, and that is where you have very high yield potential. I would say if you have parts of the field that will yield north of 130 bushels per acre, um, that would be a candidate. Um, if you've applied manure, if you planted early at a higher seeding rate, um, so your your canopy is dense and thick, um, those would be also reasons to um, where you might need to apply a PGR. Or if you're putting a single shot of nitrogen on and you apply it really early, and you're getting that really early uh, thick growth and development of a canopy, you may want to think about putting a PGR on because you, you don't want to harvest a field that's laying flat on the ground. I've done it. It's not fun. Uh, Teresa asked a question, Dennis, and she wants to know if this increased warm weather that's coming that, that Jeff is forecasting is going to uh, speed up, uh, cause an earlier wheat harvest. Yeah, I've got that question quite a bit too. Um, and I think potentially the answer could be yes, but there's still a lot of season to go here. Um, and a lot of things can change or impact um, growth and development. So we've got to see, you know, I think the three month outlook was warmer than normal temperatures. Um, so, you know, that might speed development along a little bit more quickly. Um, if that holds true, then yeah, we could potentially be headed for an earlier harvest this, this year. I went back in early March, I thought we were going to be significantly earlier based on that, you know, real huge departure from normal as far as the amount of heat unit accumulation. I was like, the whole season is going to get shifted earlier, but then we've really slowed up these last couple of weeks. So it, it potentially we could be ahead for her earlier harvest, but it's a bit too early to really say for sure. Uh, Phil asks, when should we consider putting nitrogen on our wheat? Yeah. So I know there's some folks that already have nitrogen on the wheat. Um, and it kind of depends on um, your your management philosophy. And, and I imagine Kurt is going to talk more about this on, in his presentation next week on the virtual breakfast. Um, but uh, if you're putting a single shot of nitrogen out there, um, if you've got adequate tillering, you were planted early in the fall um, so that the crop looks good. Now you got a fairly good thick stand. Um, you don't need to put on um, a green up or a freeze up application hold that a little bit and put it on maybe more around that Fix four to five. Now there, there has been some information coming out of the University of Guelph that shows um, nitrogen uptake um, and it's taking more nitrogen up earlier in the season than what we originally thought. So if you are doing split, um, you know, maybe, maybe consider a 60% upfront um, and 40% later at like Fix six or so feet six and a half, um, but uh, instead of doing like 50-50, um, move a little bit of that nitrogen a little bit earlier if you're, if you're going to do a split. But yeah, I, I think uh, at least for our research trials, um, as soon as the field conditions dry up here, we're going to go make our uh, first application here as soon as the field conditions are right for it. I've got a question, and this will be the last week question, I think, unless we get new ones put in. 
Um, but uh, wheat has just got so many positive beneficial aspects in the rotation. Um, it's just a good time to have a living cover crop over the winter, those living roots. It's just, I call it a commodity cover crop. Is there any chance that we can significantly increase wheat acres in Michigan without adversely affecting prices or overtaxing our milling capacity? Well, so there's a, a, a number of things to pull apart in that, Mike. Um, so our milling capacity is, we are very fortunate to have the number of mills that can mill the capacity of wheat that we have um, in the state of Michigan. So that that is a, a huge benefit um, for our, our local uh, wheat crop. Now, as far as, uh, you know, increasing wheat acres, how much is that going to impact price? Wheat is a globally traded commodity. And, you know, if we doubled our wheat acres in Michigan, would have almost no impact on the price, I think, because Russia can um, dump a bunch of cheap wheat on the market. They, they can produce a huge amount and with the subsidies, they can put it on the, the global market at prices that nobody can match. And so they, they can trump anything that we would do here um, in the state of Michigan. Maybe the basis might change a little bit. It might widen a bit if we um, you know, have a lot more acres and a lot more bushels of wheat here in the state. Um, but I agree with the statement that um, having more wheat acres in the rotation, there's uh, and, and growers tell me this, but we also have research data that shows um, when you have wheat in the rotation, your soybean yields are higher and your corn yields are higher um, with wheat in the rotation. So some people look at it that, well, in my wheat year, I'm not making any money or much money on the wheat crop. But when you factor in the benefit of the higher soybean yield, the higher corn yield that you get, as well as these um, cover crop type benefits where you got a green crop growing over the winter, there's some significant benefits to that. And I think as the, the food industry moves forward into these sustainability uh, programs where they, they want to encourage cover crops and, and uh, you know, things that can capture carbon and store carbon, uh, wheat would be a great crop to help uh, farmers achieve some of those sustainability goals that food companies are they're just kind of dipping their toe in the water right now, but uh, I think down the road, there's going to be more incentive for people that are willing to, to put forth and do some of those practices. So, yeah, I think wheat would be a great uh, fit for, for that all the way around. Good, good. I think we're done, Dennis, asking you questions, but if you could stick around just in case we get sure. some phone-in ones or something. Um, but uh, Aaron Hill had posted a couple of uh, things in the chat that are important. One on submitting wheat samples to the diagnostic clinic, and there's a link there. Uh, she's also linked to some articles, some timely and relevant articles that might be beneficial to you. Um, Marty Chilvers introduced a, a, a new survey he's doing. Marty, do you want to talk about your, your virus survey? Hey, Mike. Yeah. Um, there was a fair bit of interest in wheat viruses last season. Um, so we're just looking at doing more of a systematic uh, examination of what wheat viruses are occurring across Michigan to help our producers do a better job at managing those. So if, if you're interested, in, I'll reach out <clears throat> to folk here as we get into the season. But if you're interested in participating, please feel free to reach out. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Marty. And then just I want to remind everyone that at the very top of the chat, at the very front end of the chat, are those links to Dennis that Dennis showed in his slides. So if you're interested in those and you want to capture those, this would be your opportunity to do that. Um, is there any, I don't, I think we've covered all the questions in the chat. Is there anyone that wants to open up their phone line and, and ask a question? Um, are there any specialists or educators that are joining us that have an important message to convey to our audience this morning? I think I think we're probably going to wrap up. I'm just checking the chat right now. Um, nope, I think we, oh yeah, nope, I think we have everything answered. I really appreciate, Dennis, your excellent presentation, your meaningful answers. There was a comment about how well you pronounce those chemical names, and I agree. I mean, those just, man, you're fluent in chemical names. 
And uh, and then, Jeff, I want to thank you again, not only for your expertise, but also for the positive forecast. So thank you very much, both of you. Excellent presentations. So before we sign off today, I want to say that uh, we've been fortunate to have Mike as a host many times on Virtual Breakfast. And I think this is his last official Virtual Breakfast uh, hosting session. Mike will be retiring on May 2nd. And so, Mike, I just want to congratulate you on a great career and say that uh, we will miss you at the Field Crops team and know that your next career in your uh, retirement will be just as fulfilling, I'm sure. So uh, thank you so much for all your efforts for the Field Crops team and the producers across Michigan. Thank you, Carl. It's been a really good opportunity. With that, I'm going to say thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week.